Um, I'm from Florida originally. I think recently I've surpassed the time now where I've spent more time out of Florida or lived more out of Florida than I lived in Florida. So it's been a while. Uh, about three years ago we opened an office here and so we're, uh, in a sense, I've, I've kind of returned here. Um, I actually have several of my family members here who were some local, some from other, my mother, my aunt, my cousins, my sister, her husband. My aunt's 88 and she came out today, so I'm thankful for her being here. <laughs> <clears throat> They're actually here to humble me, you know. And I remember, you know, one time speaking with my father and, uh, you know, he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm giving a talk so and so, and he's like, really? People come to listen to you speak? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, and I go, they even get like educational credit for coming up. He's like, really? <laughs> and he's like, they don't, they don't do that, really. I said, yeah, they, they do, you know. So he says, send me the poster, I gotta see, you know. <laughs> so I sent it to him, and he's like, they, wow, you weren't lying, that's the truth. <laughs> So generally, that's what families are for. They're here to uh, keep you down to earth. So, um, but I always find it that maybe they learn a little bit something about me because I never really get to talk too much with them about what I do. It's more about family. So hopefully I won't put them to sleep. They're non-architects. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with um, show you a couple things that are uh, by two artists that I admire. Um, and I show them because this probably defines our work more than uh, my work itself. So on the left you see uh, an image by a German artist named Voth. Um, I don't know a lot about him. There's only one book in German that I, I have and uh, we've, we have a pretty steady stream of German interns. So their first task is actually to translate 10 pages of the book, so I'm learning more as we go along. And then <clears throat> the other side is an a, a art piece by Andy Goldsworthy. And what really um, motivates me from these is if you look, their first big, bold, striking images, you know, they stand out at you. But as you look at them further, um, they're much more than just something to look at. Like you begin to see a story unfold in the art. And both artists go to great lengths to actually photograph not just the art object itself, but the process of kind of constructing, or in Goldsworthy's case, the deconstructing um, of the project. And so what you see is a story unfolding um, within their work, and so what they're, they're, they're not just makers of objects, they're storytellers. And what you think you understand or knew about their work transforms into something completely different. And so what you thought was a snowball becomes a pile of rocks, and in Voss case, you see this huge sarcophagus, um, but he takes it on this journey through these landscapes, and he's telling you you know, really a story um, about society. And in the end, for both artists, it's the object matters little. It's really um, the experience that matters. And Frederick, Frederick Kiesler, he once said that our world is overrun by masses and masses of art objects. And he said, what we really need is an objective. And I think that's kind of what we try to do. We try to um, leave something behind with uh, a user or visitor, um, whether there's a building there or not. So like we can all think, um, I bet every single person in this room, if you think about it, you could remember a place from your childhood that was like really special, you know, or something that sticks in your head. And, you know, if you go back to visit it, 
uh, years or decades later, it always looks different. But the memory is like there as if it was yesterday. So it's really, we try to ingrain something uh, in people that experience our buildings and try not to rely on what it looks like. So for me, this started uh, kind of early in my career by, by accident. Um, this is a project we did for a um, film producer. I don't know if any of you have se ever seen the commercials, the Bud Light ones. I love you, man. It's a fairly old, he did these commercials. So what was happening in Los Angeles is these directors and producers were almost like sports stars. And, you know, they be would become, in a sense, free agents. And so they would hop from company to company, whoever paid them the most. And so a lot of the big film companies like Sony and, and others would say, listen, here's what I, wa I want to offer you. We'll pay you a lot of money. Um, and you'll get to open your own office. Call it whatever you want. We'll do the management. You can be the creative artist, and we'll take care of everything else. And so all these directors love that idea, but what they told them is, like, we want you producing that commercial in 12 weeks. You know, so they had money, but they had to start working right away, and they could have their own space and name it, so that's where we kind of came in. I was like, no one would take this job because, you know, they said you had to finish, in this case, 15 weeks. So we did this project from when they hired us to when they moved in in 15 weeks. And so we did it, uh, speaking of Scarpa, who would uh, uh, refer to a building as a drawing at full scale, this is really what this became for us. So. I had this idea about a shipping container, but not so much about the object of the container, but kind of the story that's embedded in a shipping container. It brings goods from east to west. You know, it has a history of moving across the oceans. And this is the, the shipping yard in Long Beach. There are thousands of these things in surplus, and I'd carry this add around in my pocket all the time, you know, with this idea and every client I would have, I would pull it out and show them, I say, what about we do this? And they would all laugh at me, you know, we're not doing that. And finally, this one client said, that's a great idea. Um, and this was going back to uh, almost 18 years ago. And I'm working for the same client now building a house for him in North Carolina. So, um, we basically went down to the yard, we picked out a container, and we started construction. So these were our, our design drawings, our presentation drawings, and our construction drawings. So we just literally got a permit, uh, like over the counter. I went in and said, oh, we're just moving some walls around, um, and got a permit. And then we would, as we were building, we would update it, so every day, um, the, it, the change, conditions would change. Like, the, you know, we have an idea for a stair and the contractor go, well, they don't have that steel in stock. Can you do it out of this kind of shape of steel? And we would literally do these drawings. So it was all drawn freehand, uh, the entire project. These were my sketches for it. You know, we would basically make that drawing. We would fax it at the time to the job site, and then it would be built. So um, these are just some of the things you, you know, like we developed all the finishes for the steel, you know, all the detailing for it. This was all done, like, extremely, extremely fast. And we won a bunch of awards for this project. It kind of opened my eye that, uh, about how architects work, because normally an architect will get a project, they will have an idea, they will draw it out completely, have completely designed it, it goes to bid, and then they build it. So by the time it actually starts construction, 
the architect's done. It's cast in stone. In this case, we designed to the very last day. So I started to think to myself, is there another way that an architect can practice? Can an architect practice more like a sculptor as opposed to like a technician? So I recalled um, this piece of work um, um, that I visited when I worked in New York for, for Paul Rudolph. And this is called Opus 40. It's in upstate New York. And um, my colleagues took me up there. And this is called Opus 40 because it took this artist 40 years to build it. And um, he bought this, he was, uh, bought this place, the land, it was an abandoned bluestone quarry and he bought it because he had endless supply of bluestone to make sculpture. Well, that tower in the middle is the only sculpture he actually made there, but he built this incredible landscape um, there. Um, it's just take your breath away place that he made. It took him 40 years when he died in an accident of doing it, but this is an amazing thing. He started out with an idea of what he was gonna do and wound up in a totally different place. And it's way better than any of the sculptures he ever built before. And it was because he kind of ventured a bit into the unknown and came out with something just extraordinary. So I started to look at other um, artists and sculptors, people like Henry Moore, who this is a, a drawing for one of his sculptures. And you know, Henry Moore didn't make drawings of his sculptures, he made drawings about them. And they were a way to kind of sort out his ideas of his intentions and what he was gonna do with his work, not to make a picture of it. So I thought to myself, can an architect like work like that? So I did what I usually do, I test it with my students and that's why I teach because it's kind of a laboratory for me. So I said, you know, let's do a project. This was for a client of mine for a nonprofit group who does housing for homeless. And um, we built this project for them. This was done by 10 students and myself in uh, eight weeks for $3,000. And it's called the Portable Construction Training Center and, and it takes inner city kids who don't have a high school education, former drug problems, on and on, and they teach them a construction skill. And so this is their laboratory in a way, and we, we had them actually build it and work with our architecture students. So it was an incredible experience of, you know, like architects working with former gang members. You know, they are like about as opposite as they can be um, but working together, building this project. And so, um, what, we didn't do any drawings for the project. We spent one week just coming together with some common ideas and then we started construction. And so here they are like working on the project and again, they did this beautiful project um, by students um, that's better than a lot of projects that architects would do with no drawings. Um, and so at that point, I, I was convinced there was another way to practice. So we started to work in what I call um, a parallel universe. Like we have our traditional uh, projects that keep coming in, but we work on ideas um, in our office. And so I just want to share some of these. This is an idea I was trying to um, look at. Uh, ways of how you could broadcast light through materials. And so I just started making these models of thin like wood and trying to get light to go through them. Um, we made computer models, physical models. It, it had no big beginning or no end. It was really just an investigation. And so, you know, we then uh, started looking of uh, this idea of wood of like bringing it to life. Like I was got real interested in like how we perceive wood. We usually think of it as like a tree that's very organic or a 
stud that you build the building with. You never kind of correlate the two, that it's a living organism that makes your building. We always see it as very inert. So I thought to myself, how could you become more aware that what we build with is actually an organic material? And so our idea was try to bring it to life. So we CNC'd um, these wood panels. We made computer models. Um, and it's, I started to call this, uh, or our office started to call it liquid wood. And um, right at that, about that time, someone handed me uh, this paper for a um, artist competition, a call for a competition for uh, park benches. So I uh, said, I, I think I can do that. You know, I'm an architect that qualifies for an artist. And I made this drawing and, you know, I wrote a description. I called it liquid wood and I submitted it and we won. Um, so, you know, now I was forced to figure it out and actually execute and build. So, um, you know, we, it became a blend of, of, you know, using computer technology um, and uh, hand drawings and, and making. And so we, we made these uh, sketches and computer drawings and then we just started building it. So it's made from, uh, uh, the, they call micro lamb beams that we rough uh, shaped with computer and then they were all hand carved. And you know, when I was talking to the city of Santa Monica, that's who this was for, and I told them this was a, you know, a park bench, they were like, how do you sit on that? You can't, you can't sit on that. You know, and I, it took me a long time to convince them, you know, not everyone is the same size or shape. They don't all like to sit at 16 inches. You know, some don't even like to sit. They want to lean on it, you know. So um, they were a bit skeptical, um, but um, they let me do it, all right? So we started making it, and there it is installed in the park. And, you know, so we've... What I do too is a lot with my work is I don't just do it and disappear. Like we go back over time and kind of look and see how it's performing. And there are, you know, all the park benches in this park that you buy off the shelf, no one sits on, but everyone goes to this bench, right? They play on it, they do everything. And the city has even told me like, this is the most popular thing in the park. You know, and, you know, the way I see it, it to me, it's art, um, but it's art that you can go up and touch. It's not something you look at, it's something that you engage with. And that leaves an impression on you. If you just look at it, you forget it. If you touch it, you remember it. And so, you know, a project came along. Um, this was, uh, we got hired to, um, <clears throat> remodel a Frank Geary building, and this was fresh on my mind, so I'm like, this is what I'm gonna do in this space. So we had been doing projects, and you know, we show them drawings of things like this, and contractors would see it, and they would just kind of look at it and go, wow, that's gonna be really expensive. And they don't really know how to do it, but they go, you know that last project we did, and all that custom wood, just use that price, but double it, and we'll get it to work. So our projects were getting really expensive. So we started to go directly to the vendors. So this was a cabinet shop. He had a four-axis CNC machine that he was making drawer boxes with, you know. And so I brought him some drawings, I, and the, our bench we did, I said, well, we want to do this in an editorial office. What do you think? He's like, this is fantastic. You know, where contractors, they get totally scared of it. And so we worked with the fabricator, the maker, to actually make this. Um, and we got the price. We gave it to our client, which was about 20% uh, of what the contractor had bid. And, you know, he made it in his shop, uh, milled them all. We did the mock-up. Their numbered came to the job site, and in they went. Like, 
again, this is a 15 week project that we did all this stuff. So that's, these are, um, you can see these are doors. That's a door you see in there. They're editorial offices. My client loves it because he tells his clients go to studio two and he points to the wall and they look at him puzzled, you know? So they go up and they touch the wall and they kind of fall in, you know? But again, this is a place everyone goes and they touch it. They reach up and they touch the wood. And, you know, they just, it becomes more powerful when they engage in it. So the same project I'm working on and I get up in the morning go to Starbucks to get a coffee at five in the morning and they're painting this bus shelter like by my house. And I like get my camera out, like look at that, that's incredible, like the color. So I go to my office that morning and we got a new thing to do. It's like looking at light and color. So we start making models. Um, I've got containers full of these things now, um, but you know, looking at different materials that you can broadcast light through. And so what I got, there's recycled glass, marbles, um, there are a lot of things, but I got enamored with what you see in these drawings in the lower right. These are 1 8 inch acrylics that you could buy like at Home Depot. There are thousands of colors and they're all ugly colors. There's not one nice color in the thousands of them. So I got rings of them and I just started stacking them up looking if I could make a beautiful color, you know, through layers of them. And so we wound up getting not just the color but the patterns um, by just stacking uh, eight layers of 1 8 inch acrylic and we just incorporated that into that same project. So there are skylights behind it and they're backlit so the color kind of broadcasts um, into the space. Um, that same project I showed you before, you know, when we started this, I had these mock-ups, the metal one, sitting on a shelf, um, you know, in my office somewhere, and we're working on a project for another client that does prop placement, and, you know, they look at it and say, what's this, you know, and I explain it to them, and they go, can you do one of those for me? And I'm like, I guess I can, you know. So they needed a dressing room in there because they give away merchandise to celebrities and they all have to, you know, try things on. And um, so I said, yeah, we can do that. So I called up these guys I work with. These are former students of mine that uh, started a steel fabrication place and we drew it bigger, we printed it out, and they made it in their, in their shop. All right, so I got to this point, we had pretty much finished the space, um, and I had no idea how to skin it. It's like, what do you put on the outside of that thing? It's like, I was lost. You know, I didn't know what to do. My clients, they're gonna be moving in, like within a week, and, uh, I assured them that I had everything under control. Um, in the meantime, I had no idea what to do. Then I started avoiding the calls. And I was about ready to fess up to them that I have no idea what to do at this point. And I'm driving to my house, and right at the end of my block, for the first time ever, the guy who used to fix my old Volvo William B. Leith III, a sign says automotive genius on it, you know. But right next to it, he has a sign that says, will shrink wrap anything, you know. So I pulled in, you know, and I said, William, you know, you do shrink wrap? And he's like, he laid it on me. I shrink wrap boats for the military, blah, blah, blah. So I drove right to my office and I got this mock up. It's like this big. And I brought it to him, I said, can you shrink wrap this? And he laid it on me thick, that easy, you know, no problem. Well, a couple days later I came back and he was a little bit dejected, you know. <laughs> he said, well, it was harder than I thought it was gonna be, you know. <laughs> and um, 
So after a while, I, I just sat with him and talked to him, what's the problem, why didn't it work, blah, blah, blah. So we took this back to the shop, we made some modifications based on his comments, and I convinced him to do it full scale. So we basically made it like a pig on a spit, we heated up the space, and he basically worked and rotated it. And so this is it in the end. And um, you can't draw this, you just can't draw it. And I think some of the magic is in not knowing everything. And so, you know, I'm not a freewheeling guy that just throws caution to the wind, but we call it a little bit of calculated risk taking. But when we do this, we do it with our clients. We don't just tell them. So they kind of know what they're getting when we talk to them. But you know, it's really quite beautiful, and I like the kind of magic that comes with not knowing everything or learning. Um, so we always look for things like that. This is another project, same thing, super fast. Um, I found this guy who has this machine that bends steel, and, you know, we're working on a space. We have two construction sites, so we're building the building, but then building these things that come to the building. In this case, it's two boardrooms that are being built off-site, and they're just done in, in plath and laster and rebar with a little bit of tube steel. So I was, you know, everyone hates stucco or plaster. Anyone here, architects like stucco, you know? It's like, it's like a nemesis. It's like I was determined to find something beautiful about plaster. You know, so, you know, this is what we did. This, we let the plaster ooze through the lath. So what, you know, I call, call it a bit of like psychoanalysis. Like we all know that this is inside the wall. Like when you plaster, that's inside, but we let it be revealed. So it's like we revealed what you already know is there. And so part of it is, is, kind of just highlighting that. So even though this is plaster, people come up and like want to touch it again, like it's fabric. And so the inside is super smooth and polished and the outside is really rough and just oozing um, through the lath. So what I've figured out is that, um, you know, the interesting thing about art is that there's really a fine line between the peculiar and the beautiful, um, between fine art and popular culture. You know, what I've become interested in is the moment where those two co-mingle. So I'm interested in being both the teacher and the students, the teacher and the student, and trying to find what I call the extraordinary within the ordinary. So what we try to do is like not invent but look right in front of our face and find things that can be seen in different ways. So I'm gonna just show you quickly some of those things. We've built out of almost anything you can imagine. These are Dixie Cups. Um, and this was my first real corporate client. And when I visited the site with him, you know, he was very anxious to know my ideas. And I had this idea, but I didn't wanna tell him because I didn't want to lose my first corporate client that quickly. <laughs> um, but he got it out of me, you know, and I said, I'm thinking Dixie Cups. And he said, you are not doing Dixie Cups in my space, you know. So I went back to the office, and I had Vanessa make that mock-up there on the left, and I, I emailed it to him, you know. I said, what do you think of this? And, you know, it comes back with the capital wow with all the, exp you know, the exclamation points and he's like what is it and I just emailed him back said Dixie Cups <laughs> and so away we went but the idea was this is on the south facade so they broadcast light through it like an oculus and you know these just snap in and out of this wall and um, you know I go back to this place later and I see all those cups are like blue. Then one day they're all clear. You know, then there are something else. The guy who didn't want Dixie cups is now playing with our building. <laughs> you know, I think that's great, you know? 
So we've done things with ping pong balls. Um, and what's super interesting, you know, when an architect calls up some of these companies, like, you know, can you send us 40,000 ping pong balls? They like, they sense industrial espionage, you know, like, what's this guy doing? But, you know, in this case, it was an, an edit studio, and edit studios are usually pitch black because they cannot stand glare on their screen. And for me, this was a way to actually solve their problem because when we looked at them, the studies we had did, the ping pong balls allow light to come through, but they, the, there's no glare. It just becomes a uniform, the monitor becomes kind of a bit, bit pixelated, um, and you don't get the glare you would by having a window or a spotlight. So these are the studios. You can see you get light, the broadcast, well lit, broadcast light through it, and, um, you know, we floated them over this kind of pond, but when people come in here, you know, they're like, wow, what is that? You know, they're attracted by the, the light, and then when they get close and they see it's ping pong balls, it kind of heightens their experience because it's something familiar, something that they know. Um, this is a building we did out of uh, recycled uh, aluminum cans. Uh, it's an affordable housing project. We worked with a recycler to crush these uh, custom blocks for us, and I'd go out on a limb and say this is probably the the only affordable housing project in the U.S. that has Schlitz malt liquor cans built into the facade. <laughs> um, this is an office building using industrial brooms, and you know I wanted to kind of do this soft building. This is west facing, and it's all glass behind there, so you know it's a shade screen. Um, but in this case, you know, the, what you see on the lower right-hand side, we went to the store and just bought off-the-shelf brooms. And we would call the manufacturer up and ask a lot of questions. And he was, again, he thought, you know, we're trying to steal his proprietary information. And we explained to him what we were doing. And he flew out from Michigan to see what we were doing. You know, in the meantime, when I had talked to my client about using brooms for their building, they're like, isn't it going to collect dirt? You know, and I, I didn't know, you know, isn't it going to deteriorate? You know, so when the guy came and visited, I asked him the same questions. And he's like, oh, no, we make it out of this anti-static. Nothing will sit on it, you know, to last forever. I just regurgitated to my client. They think I'm a genius, you know. <laughs> And so they really, we work with them to design the building. Um, this is uh, right downtown LA. Uh, we were hired by Aesop. Some of you may know uh, Aesop, their uh, Australian cosmetic company, to do a flagship store for them in downtown LA. Well, right around the corner is the fashion district. And like, this is what you see there. And these bolts of fabric are like all over, and I drive through the neighborhood and there's piles of these cardboard tubes just in bins. So I start talking to people about getting the tubes. Um, and so we collected up a whole bunch of tubes and we made a store using cardboard tubes. So this entire store is made from cardboard tubes. The fire department hated me, but that's another story. Um, but even the light fixture you see is uh, made from a cardboard tube. Um, the countertops are all cardboard. Even the shelves, quarter inch thick uh, shelves made from paper. It has a little carbon fiber in there too, but uh, by and large it's pretty much all uh, paper. And here you can kind of, even the cabinets are made with cardboard tubes. Um, and the same thing is we get the same kind of thing. The first thing people want to do is they walk in and they put their hands on it. And I think that's great. So, you know, I always am looking, I'm looking, I try, we try to look like not far away, but right in front of our face, something that's kind of common. This is a market in Mexico City on the left. And I took this picture in the Orlando airport of all the tourist attractions, you know, which is if you take 
each one of the, these things in itself, the canopy or one of these things, are really ugly, but the collage of them are together is really quite extraordinary. And it's like, how do you make something that beautiful, you know, that simple, you know, and, and still be beautiful? And I found these uh, when I was teaching um, in Mississippi. I found these ladies in uh, western Alabama. In, it's uh, uh, G's Bend. And these ladies make these quilts. No design education whatsoever. Um, they make them out of, you know, their grandfather's shirt pockets. They've become quite famous now. But these are some of the quilts that they make. You know, again, no design education whatsoever. And I'm like <coughs> saying, how can, you, how can I do something that beautiful, that free, that easy, you know, without being so constrained? And so often I will, you know, a way for me to start is to paint to make things and that kind of always loosens me up a little bit so you know I I'm just giving you kind of a flash of some of the things I do but it's always looking at patterns you know and how we can kind of use that this is one I made with my uh, with my son you know that uh, it's just leftover strip leftover pieces of wood in my shop and this was a summer project that I did with him but the idea that you can repeat things or look at kind of simple things repeated over and over and how you can make that beautiful. So we, we did a project here not too long ago that we finished for the city of Pembroke Pines. Uh, they built a new uh, city center and they asked us to do this, what they call the gateway sculpture. Um, so these again are some of our drawings and what, you know, we had a limited budget and so the idea was like to make this thing which we wanted to kind of move in the wind, but how could we do it, you know, with their budget? And so, you know, we came up with this idea to use the boat building industry and just make stainless steel rings. And we wrote the software program to say, how can we just take the rings and let them, we pick the sizes that could be fabricated and then let the computer program actually design it within certain parameters. So this just is how we could deal with it, you know, being made. Um, so we, we came up once we did this with a kit of parts, um, and uh, we, if they're all similar prefab parts. We, we had the parts, we, we actually wound up having it made in Denver. Um, and here you can see it in the shop and delivered to the site, and there it is. So it's about a year old uh, now. So, you know, th and things like this too, I'm always like looking for like things that repeat, like that set of stamps. It's intriguing to me, not the individual piece, but the relationship between all of the parts. Like they're not perfect. You know, they're the same, but they're not perfect. You know, and like the stacking of books, like if they were perfect, it would really be uninteresting. And so I started to really develop ideas about, you know, things that can be repetitive uh, because it makes them less expensive. And, but how do you make it not boring? Like I like to say, you know, I tell my students sometime, you know, if I give you a candy bar, you like get all excited. But if I make you eat 17 in a row, you're going to want to kill me, you know. So there can be too much of a good thing. So it's like, how can you make it in a way boring but interesting at the same time? So we, we got a commission for a house in Chicago. And I, uh, you know, I wanted to do a brick house. If you work in Chicago, you have to do brick. Even though my client wanted a steel house, I convinced them brick would be better. So we started to make these drawings of brick. This is like, you know, relentless drawing of just bricks. And we came up with this idea of how to stack brick. Um, and so we use, you know, like computer software, not as really a design tool, but as a way to kind of manifest ideas. 
And so these are, again, just some of the drawings that we make. This is a drawing of every single brick and its rotational um, degree on the facade. And then we'll make models of it. And this is kind of, sorry for the sound here. This is, um, um, so the idea was that the building, in a sense, could move. You know, it's like moving buildings never work, but we wanted to capture this idea of motion. And so um, also, you know, this is a typical building in Chicago. Um, and you can see the bricks on the side are always different. They're called Chicago Common, where those are all the bad brick and they put them where you can't see them. Well, that's what I wanted to make our building with, with the Chicago Common brick, because I think the ugly can be beautiful. And so here we are building it. Um, and they're just these kind of rows of brick that then rotate. Um, the horizontal is just a flat bar that it, it's not structural only in that it supports the lateral load. The bricks support themselves. Um, and here it is, uh, detail of it. And that's uh, the building. So you can see it. It, it, the static picture doesn't really do justice because it's moving um, as the light moves through it. It really looks like the building is moving. And so the client has now told me that people drive by his house and they stop. Um, but they stop and then they inch their car forward and then they back it up and then they, <laughs> they inch it forward and like back it up. They're like trying to see if the building's actually moving you know, and if they can see through, uh, through the house. And that's how you enter it, and the courtyard, that's the other side, what you see when you're in the living space here. Um, and that's our client, Robert, in his office. And here's the living uh, room. It's a very small, modest house. And then we just finished this proposal for uh, a 370 unit project in uh, Shenzhen, China. And um, same, same idea with the panels that kind of rotate um, as you um, go up. And you can see as you move around the building, it has that same thing, like the building appears to be moving as you move around it, but it's like totally um, static, the building. So you get the idea. So you know, I look at artists a lot because I, they, they're so much freer in how they work. And this is another artist that I really like. His name is Patrick Hughes. And he did the series of paintings, which he used to call prospectivities. Actually, I looked online. I told someone about it. And they go, I can't find them. You know, and he's changed the name now to something else. Um, but what's fascinating is those are not moving paintings. They're just, from the perspective of the user, they appear to move by how he shaped the canvas. And so um, we, we got commissioned to do a housing project, and this was kind of fresh on my mind, too, along with you know the other ideas I was talking about, like repetition. So we worked with a local company for, or they're, they're a big company, a um, lot of architects will know them, C.R. Lawrence. Uh, they have a two million square foot facility in LA and I went and worked with them to make this shutter. And I guess it's about as close to manufacturing as you could get in architecture, but we worked at this one shutter, how we would make it, and then once we refined it, we just repeated it over the entire building. And so it's not just for aesthetics, it becomes for performance. So this is in an urban area. And what happens is, is the people inside, 
can move them however they want. So the building, in a sense, redesigns itself every day or every hour or every moment, depending on if they want views, if they want privacy, if they want sunlight or not. And so with like a simple repetitive screen, you could get something really that's quite interesting. So it's a stucco box, it's got a shallow porch, and then it's got the shutters around it. And you get really a light-filled um, space um, within it. And then we did some other interesting things. That's the backsplashes in the kitchen. Those are made from um, recycled skateboards. We got a bunch of skateboards and we cut them up and we made them like tiles. Um, this uh, 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 diagram of a flight path, I don't know where it came from, but it's a landing and takeoff, and they're pretty much the same coordinates given to the pilot, you know, for landing and takeoff, but it's so interesting to me the difference in how they, the pattern comes out by the same exact coordinates that are given. And so we're always looking for ways to do repetition but to really make it that beautiful by repeating. And, you know, when I was a kid, I had this thing, some of you may have had a spirograph, you know, and like a four-year-old can do this drawing with the spirograph, you know, and they're just straight lines, you know. And so I started thinking about this idea of just, can you make a building out of these simple lines, you know? So I started looking at other things like pickup sticks, you know, Pickup sticks, like when you throw them out, it's like watching the fireplace, you know? They're like interesting how they all pile up, you know? But in the box or at as an individual there, it's totally boring. So I started to look at ways like what can you do with a line, right? And so if you just take lines and you place them together, like in a way, you can create these super complex geometries. Um, with a super simple means. And I thought this has a lot of potential like for architecture, for buildings. Um, you know, because you can do super interesting things that appear complicated but are really quite simple. So we, uh, we uh, entered this competition uh, for it's like a 600,000 square foot transit center in Seattle. It was design build, so we teamed with the contractor and we made all these beautiful renderings. I had this whole idea in mind, and we won. And so our contractor completely freaked out, you know, because it's a guaranteed max, $53 million, not a penny more. You got to build what you showed us. And so he was like freaking out. We can't do this. So I started to show them, show him you know, all the ways that we could do it, the, the diagram I just showed you, and then he got really interested in it. So we moved, moved ahead with the idea, but I kept thinking too about this, like I, idea of the line and space and kept looking at that. Um, this is um, um, a colleague of mine at USC, uh, choreographer, artist, William Forsyth, who did this improvisational piece um, that um, he explored kind of lines and space with just using light. And I thought it was really interesting, could I do the same thing with architecture? So we started to make all these drawings like that, you know, which I thought were fascinating, but at the same time, we would be writing scripts of uh, how to construct this. And so we basically, I'm just showing you some diagrams, I won't bore you with all the technical parts, but um, in the perfect world, if everything is the same, this would be a flat line. It means that every piece of our building is the same. There are no unique pieces. This was our first output of our design. You can see there's literally no pieces the same. They're all unique, which was, is a nightmare to, you know, it would be super expensive. So by the time we got to the end, you could see that line's really flattened out. And so there's 8,000 pieces um, in our facade, and we had um, less than 100 unique pieces. And this was all 
engineered, you know, so it's like a moving part, like spans, uh, weight of material, and so forth. So, you know, it was, it, it was in a way a lot like William Forsyth's dance of chore choreographing all the technical issues of materials to get them to kind of work. So again, these are just some of our technical drawings where we rationalize all the geometry. And so our computer programs, we literally took our, our computer uh, outputs, sent them directly to the fabricators, and they built it from our uh, software. So we would send them the computer program. This is what would come out to the site. Um, all built, not with measuring a single thing on the site. Um, and there you see it in construction. Um, and then we did the same with the facade. When I did the competition, I thought we would kind of just go buy some stock tubes, you know, from uh, a supply house and put them up. Um, didn't quite work that easy. Uh, we looked at some uh, stock components that met our concept, but then we actually started, we made a custom extruded piece that met the idea. And you can kind of see the difference between the stock part and how when we engineered this, how it started to change. And that was like our final uh, extrusion shape uh, for the project. Here it is in the uh, factory um, being tested um, in the factory. And there's our very happy contractor with all the parts <laughs> going out of the factory. So it was put up. Um, by four guys, two cherry pickers, and one week. So there it is uh, going up, and the final product. You know, so it's similar to what I was showing in the early work, you know, but it's instead of it being like a hands-on drawing, we're figuring out ways to do this um, using technology. But here, you know, you could see uh, this is a, you know, it's, it's a garage transit hub. It has a plaza. There's a lot of places for people, but you get this kind of beautiful play of light. Um, here's a view from the subterranean parking lot. And then there's our happy clients, the city of Seattle, after everything. Um, we, we, our work is jumping in scale. Um, but I think some of the same ideas are holding true. This is a 500 unit housing project right along the uh, 110 freeway in LA. <clears throat> and, um, you know, again, like when you get to something of that scale, like a dollar on, you know, a million things is a million dollars at the cost. Like you can't vary much in cost because it still costs a lot of money. So like in this case, we started to look at like how a typical concrete building uh, is built. And you know, they just form a square box. And we said, okay, what, how much more effort is it to form it with some articulated edges? And so we looked at how you place those edges together um, to make really, again, the housing stacks perfectly. These are just all done on the balconies. So the balconies change size a little bit, and then you get a building, you know, a 30-story building that looks like interesting, it looks different, but it's really very simple. And so you get a facade that uh, changes. Uh, it can change, you know, when it changes orientation, but, you know, it has a sense of movement to it, which, which I think makes it kind of exciting and interesting. We're redoing right now the um, Flower, uh, the original Flower Mart in Los Angeles. This is owned by a group of Japanese. It's a co-op, 50 families own this. And, you know, like everything, even the flower business is affected by the internet. You, they tell me you can buy fresh flowers real easy now. So, you know, this started the flower market in uh, 1940, 1930, uh, when the Japanese were not allowed to sell flowers, so they formed their own co-op and bought this building, and the 53 families were all growers, and they sold their flowers here. Now, 
over several generations, there's only two families left that are growers and you know, none of the kids want to be in the business. And so they're looking for a way to have some income. So we're shrinking the flower mart, uh, but we're also uh, adding uh, 350 units of housing and retail and so forth. But the same idea as the last project. It's a simple, kind of box that's going to have a really rich facade using the same kind of techniques. Um, this is the street, the flower market's on the ground, and it changes as you move around um, the building. Um, we're just coming out of entitlements on this, so we're probably going to start construction probably late in 2019. <coughs> I'm going to close with something that uh, is sort of dear to my heart. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier I grew up in Florida, and I always loved these buildings. Um, this is, you know, called, referred to, of those don't know, a cracker house or a dog trot house. It's kind of when the, the, the Quackers or Quakers came here, you know, this is what they built. It's like super simple house. It's meant to work with the environment. And raised off the ground so breezes could go under, no insects could get in, cross ventilation. And they call it a, also a shotgun house because you could shoot a shotgun straight through it. And uh, this is one of my projects when I was a grad student called the tree house. And I was, it was kind of a, I was enamored with like that powerful idea of like living with nature, you know, but the artistic part of living with nature, I wasn't so interested in like what today has become, uh, you know, energy efficiency, but this has all the hallmarks of a sustainable building. I had no idea it was called that back then, but I was doing sustainability before you know anyone even talked about it and I worked for this guy Gene Leedy um, who did these incredible buildings in Florida where the relationship between inside and outside was just kind of magical I also worked for this guy Paul Rudolph in New York who did these uh, this is the umbrella house which has now been remarkably uh, restored it's in Sarasota and even open to the public but this was, uh, uh, he referred to as the umbrella house, and he built this trellis. Uh, he went to a local tomato farmer and bought tomato steaks to make this trellis over the house. And so he built this beautiful modernist box, as you know, in Florida, and shaded it with this trellis. Now, it blew off three times, uh, but that's besides the point. <laughs> It won't blow off anymore. They've made it out of aluminum and reinforced with steel. Uh, but the idea that you could do this beautiful thing in like the harshest environment, you know, Florida, it's like when I worked for Gene Leedy, I remember he had a leak in his building and he had me go on the roof to look at it and there was an oak tree growing out of his concrete roof, you know. <laughs> it's just the climate here is like incredible. Um, and when I lived, moved to California and I started doing my own house, this was kind of fresh on my mind. You know, we, we remodeled a house, we called it the solar umbrella, which embodied a lot of those principles, but we call it more of, um, you know, um, it, in, it enhances, we call it global regionalism, where you're taking, you're looking at regional ideas of energy efficiency, but incorporating global technology such as solar panels and other things um, to do this. So it's wrapped by 80 solar panels. Um, this is what it looked like before we started. And uh, as my friends would say to me, we took all the charm away. <laughs> and this is what it looks like now. And uh, you know, it's like a real indoor outdoor living, which is what you can do in California like you can't do in Florida, but um, we have a less than $500 a year power bill. And there's our living space. The stair um, 
is uh, acts like a chimney. It's uh, made out of perforated metal, so the hot air rises through it. We rarely turn on the lights, or uh, and there's no air conditioning in the building either. And that's the solar canopy off of our bedroom that um, covers our porch. And, and this a house in Silver Lake, same idea. It's, it's, this is an ener zero energy house next to a, a Neutra house on a steep, unbuildable site, so they say. Um, this is a lead platinum um, uh, uh, affordable housing project for disabled veterans that we just finished, 52 units. Same thing, you know, super energy efficient. It's lead platinum. Um, we, this is a, the, the patio on the second floor. It's, this is original artwork. We work with a friend of mine who has a company and we got him to actually put art in the courtyard of the building. So it's real, people's really weird for built, for um, people, you know, we have a lot of visitors to this now. They come in and they recognize the artwork and they're like, wow, that, that's original artwork, you know? It's like, how'd you get that, you know? And so it's so interesting to see like veterans who a lot of them, you know, are schizophrenic and have other issues. They're like there amongst very valuable artwork. Um, this is another affordable housing project that we're about to start construction in uh, Venice. It's 50 units, same thing will be lead platinum. Um, a school we finished recently, it's got 600 solar panels built into the facade. Um, um, the courtyard, it's on the south, so it shades itself. It's an inv infill site, um, but this school generates 75% uh, of its own power needs. Um, this is the west facing. You can see as you move around, these are these vertical fins on the west and behind it's all glass. So what you get is you get these classrooms that are light filled, no glare with views. Like everyone wants these classrooms. And then a school we just finished in South Central LA um, where we use the screen uh, this ba basically this building building is bulletproof. It's in a gang uh, territory, but you know the screens become places where they can have private courtyards behind it. Um, Mexico City. This was the first uh, lead uh, certified building in Mexico. But again, you see the shadow pattern, like all shaded the north facing glass around uh, the entry over here, um, all in shade. The perforations allow light, filtered light to come through the building. You can kind of see it here. And a museum in Salt Lake City that's also recently finished, same idea. The sustainable building doesn't have to wear the solar panels on its sleeve. And, uh, same thing, uh, uh, one we're working on now, a, a mixed-use office building in Culver City. And this was a proposal for a chapel in, uh, at the University of North Florida. Uh, it was a competition which we did not win. Um, but the idea was to kind of make this, uh, kind of, it's all made out of little bits of wood. And the, the idea is like, I remember, my mom's here, but I'm going to say it anyways, you know. Our, our house was the only house on the block that would, was dripping on the inside of the glass. You know, it was like nice and cold in our house. And, you know, we would be out on the lake, you know, sweating in shorts and come in and you'd like stiffen up as soon as you walked in, you know. So the idea was like to create this transition where you have an outside space that would not just cool you off before you went in, but allow your eyes to adjust and so forth before you go into the space. And then it would be this big light filled space made out of um, lamella uh, truss woodwork. And then um, this is where it all started. I'm gonna just leave you with this last one. This is the first LEED certified project in the world. Um, and it was the first housing project that I ever had done. 
It's in downtown Santa Monica. It's got, um, uh, it's got about 300 solar panels on it, produces all of its own power. It's affordable housing. And, um, you know, when we did this, I didn't think we were doing anything special. I just, to me, it just made common sense. Like uh, we say, who, anyone out here not like fresh air, you know, or natural light, you know, so we would do these things with, you know, clean and interior environments, lots of natural light cross ventilation. And if you do that, your building can actually be pretty horrible and people will like it, you know. <laughs> So we took it a bit further and like when we did this, when we were under construction in about 2002, we had a brownout in California and we were, became the poster child for kind of saving our planet. <laughs> that was, you know, we were all over the news. Um, and it's like, you find this, like now I see it everywhere. This was at the Santa Monica Museum you know, and it was right behind my old office. And, you know, they rolled the solar panel out like every day, you know, like, look, they put the cones around it and everything, you know, <laughs> like it's doing something, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to ask them, you know. Um, this is, you know, they're delivering vaccines on a solar refrigerated camel, you know. Um, so they do this you know, it's everywhere where we haven't been good at this is on a big institutional level. So I'm gonna leave you tonight with a quote by uh, one of our great um, architectural historians. And he wrote in an essay on architecture and civilization where he said that, um, he said that um, our architectural development is bound up with the course of our civilization to the extent that we permit our institutions and organizations to function blindly as our bed is made, so must we lie on it. Um, the ability to select the ability to select and control our heritage from the past to alter our present attitudes and habits and to project fresh forms into which <clears throat> our energies may be freely poured. Thank you very much.